Nope. Okay. Here we go. Hello, 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 everyone. It's Anxiety. We are back on, and this time we have a guest. We are on with Dr. David Sussman tonight. Hi, David. Welcome, welcome. Hey, how are you doing? Oh, we're so excited to have you and so excited to, uh, yeah, to, to, to pick your brain. Um, as, glad to be here. Thank you. Oh, oh, that means a lot. Um, so first of all, thank you so much for reaching out to, to me when you did, because I, I got to participate in um, on, on your website. And I kind of want to let everybody know all about that. So if you could introduce yourself and, and tell us about what you do and, and your background, that would be awesome. Let's start there. Yeah, sure. So, uh, yeah, my name is David Sussman. I'm a clinical psychologist, and uh, currently I uh, am an assistant professor at the University of Kentucky in Lexington. And uh, I have also done a lot of uh, work, clinical work. Uh, I worked for a, for a good number of years in an inpatient psychiatric hospital and provided care to people with all kinds of different mental health challenges and substance use concerns. And uh, what I get to do now is really fun because I get to train future uh, psychologists and mental health clinicians and get to uh, kind of supervise them and help them get on their way. So my current role is one of uh, more of teaching and training. Understood. Wow. Okay. Um, and can you tell us a little bit more about uh, the site that, that, that you have and its purpose? Yeah. So I, I run a mental health and uh, wellness site at davidsuffman.com and uh, we can provide more uh, information on some of my other social media later. But uh, I, I try to provide a lot of uh, science-based resources to uh, help people kind of cope with mental health issues. And I was fortunate to meet you, and we did a, a nice uh, profile of you in my series that's called Stories of Hope, where we acknowledge people who have had different uh, mental health journeys and let them kind of tell their own story. And I was so happy to be able to uh, feature you and to uh, uh, learn more about you as well. And so. That's another thing I do. I do a lot of those kind of profiles where we have people kind of share their own journey and talk about some of the challenges they face and kind of how they're doing now. And a lot of those folks, including yourself, have kind of gotten into advocacy. And so they're doing lots of cool stuff in the mental health advocacy space. And um, then I also do, do just a lot of kind of uh, informational articles. And lately I've been doing a lot of stuff, obviously, about kind of COVID and the pandemic and some resources uh, for anti-racism and, you know, different kinds of topical things. But I try to just, uh, I try to get a post out about once a week. That's awesome. Thank you so much for, for thank you so much for, for all of that. That's really great. Uh, can, can I ask what got you uh, into psychology? What got you started? Yeah, sure. I, I uh, told this story a couple of times. I'm not, I, it's kind of a funny one because I started out thinking I wanted to be a physician, an MD. And so that was, I was a pre-med in college and went through all of the pre-med classes. And then I encountered organic chemistry, which did not sit well with me. That seemed like that was like a foreign language for me. Um, meanwhile, I was taking some psychology cor courses and I thought, wow, this is a lot more interesting to me than organic chemistry. So I actually switched and became a psychology major. And that kind of set me on the path to becoming a psychologist after many many, many more years of uh, grad school and training and so forth. But uh, it was probably a good decision for me because I don't, I don't think I probably would have been the best, uh, you know, ER doctor or whatever I was thinking about back in the, back in those days. This is, yeah. It's, it's interesting how uh, we kind of, we fall into things that, uh, that are right for us without realizing a lot. I, I feel like that's the story with a lot of people is that the things that you yeah. really end up being good at are not the things you set out to do originally. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and, yeah. and sometimes those uh, sort of serendipitous turns and paths along the way are good things for us because they take us in a good direction. Yeah, I, I mean, what you've what you've been doing for mental health advocacy has been amazing. So I, I strongly, I definitely stand by that. Uh, so my next question to you is: obviously, we're kind of we're aware of the state of the world, and I have a ton of questions in terms of like, how the heck do we cope with it? Uh, because, well, and I, I feel like all you hear, right, and, and I think the older you get, the more you have to say it, like, oh, man, the world sure is on fire now. But, like, really, when people said that 10 years ago, there wasn't a plague going on, you know, like, a few things yep. have changed. So uh, do you feel like, do you, like, do you feel like the environment now is a little bit harder on our mental health? Or is that, like, a, 
you know. Yes, without a doubt. You know, yeah. um, part of part of the work I do is we have grad students who are providing psychotherapy, which has now gone to online psychotherapy because you know we're not seeing anybody face to face right, right, right. now. But uh, yeah, I mean, these are you know these are incredible, uh, unprecedented times. We're going through a lot. Uh, everybody talks about you know the next thing is going to be this sort of tsunami of mental health problems that we're going to yep. be seeing coming down the road in the next uh, you know months or years or whatever. And um, yeah, I think we've never most of us have never ever dealt with anything like this. Yeah, yeah. And so, do you find that like do you think more people are anxious now than there used to be? Because I know that that's a thing that keeps coming up. Like more people are depressed and anxious and. And I always say, like, I don't know, because a lot more people are diagnosed now. But what what are your thoughts? Yeah, there? and actually, there's there's a little bit of data on that. Um, the American Psychological Association, of which I'm a member, uh, does this survey every year about stress in America. And so they just did another one about a month ago. And this is like the most stress that uh, citizens in our country have ever been since they've been measuring sort of levels of stress and so forth. And so... Uh, yeah, without a doubt, we're, we're seeing more stress, more anxiety, more depression. And then you think about just the isolation, you know, all the effects of all the isolation and then the financial stress people are going through with, you know, not being able to work or they've lost their jobs. And uh, I mean, it's just one, you know, it's one thing after another. Yeah. Yeah. Do you, uh, it's interesting because social media comes up and I kind of asked you, you know, right before as we were trying to set up the topic and everything. Um, and I see that you're fairly active on social media. Do you think social media has like a, a big, especially with, you know, with like big move, like I feel like COVID has been huge and the awareness of COVID and the misinformation, everything like that's been huge on Twitter and then Black Lives Matter movement. Like not everybody can, can handle, you know, the, the, the big stressful movements that are, that are going on. And do you feel like that has an impact on us as well? I mean, I, you know, I think you, you would probably agree. I mean, social media is like many things. It can be a blessing or sometimes it can be a curse. You know, there's sometimes people, we put a lot of really good, helpful information out there. And then sometimes there's just a lot of uh, either misinformation or people are just uh, kind of ventilating sort of their own uh, emotions. And there's nothing, you know, inherently wrong with that. But some of that can also be really, I think, upsetting to other people. I know that I've been hitting the... Uh, news for 30 days button on Facebook a lot, you know, because yeah. I, there are just some people that I, I just, I guess I don't see their view or I don't agree or whatever. And, and so I'm right. just filtering out some of that because I, and I think that's probably a good point is that we have to kind of think about what we can tolerate and we may need to start filtering a few things and hopefully leave ourselves with some positivity and leave ourselves with some good news information and good reliable media and, you know, try to be bringing ourselves some helpful and, and healthy information and try to maybe weed out some of that other stuff. So what do you think that there is a balance? Because a lot of people talk about, well, it's a privilege to be able to just sign off of social media and then not experience, uh, you know, not experience racism or sign off of social media and then not experience, you know, gender inequality and all that or just. Uh, yeah. So how do you keep yourself informed while still? Yeah. Y yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm not going to sign off because I, I have too much of a desire to always learn and to be informed and, you know, and then hopefully to contribute through some education or helping direct people to some resources that may be useful. So I'm, I'm not going to sign off because in some ways I feel like then I'm sort of like stepping off the playing field or I'm not doing my part because I still feel like I need to get my voice out there and, you know, we need to have all of the all of the great you know, people who want to make a difference out there and, and trying to raise the voices and raise the awareness. And so, um, but I, I, I just do think you have to, you always have to think about self-care and you have to think about um, understanding kind of your own limits and what you, what you can tolerate or not tolerate. And you do have some control over what, you know, what comes through your feed or what, what you see or what you respond to. And so I think everybody has some choices they can make that hopefully will help them find kind of that balance where they can still uh, be informed, but at the same time, they can maybe shield themselves from some of the real disturbing or real negative stuff that just may be personally really tough for them to handle. Yeah, okay, so there, it's, a, it's a matter of like curating. Can you maybe elaborate a bit more on that? Like what kind of, so I, I'm not gonna stop reading the news because I need to be no. informed, but like, yeah. It, yeah. yeah, and this is this is where we you know go down the slippery slope where I'm you know I don't want to like be too political or whatever, but obviously 
politics enters into politics a lot of Politics have a huge impact right yeah. now. Yeah. yeah. And so, you know, depending on where you are on the political spectrum, then, you know, you may want to gravitate toward those kinds of voices if that's what you like to hear. If you're more conservative, you may want to hear those voices. If you're more liberal, you may want to hear those voices. And so you, ha you do have some choices over the different kinds of media. And that may be part of the curation because if I'm, if I'm on one side, maybe I don't want to hear so much of the other side all the time. And so, you know, you may curate a little bit, but then sometimes I want to hear the other side and I want to kind of know what the other viewpoints are. But I, I think the other thing is kind of the idea of, uh, you know, the overall sort of dosage, you know, like I can't okay. do eight hours of news a day. I just can't do that, you know? Right. So for me, I find if I do maybe 15 minutes in the morning and 15 minutes in the evening, then maybe a lot of times that's enough for me because I just, I don't want to have it all day long, every five minutes coming at me. So uh, I think that can be another strategy that people can try to decide how they might want to limit it a little bit. When you find that you are getting overwhelmed or maybe, you know, maybe even diving deeper and we can kind of make this a two part question, but um, mm -hmm. one, when you're getting overwhelmed, like what is something that you can easily do other than shut off your phone? Cause duh. But uh, two, you know, what is something that somebody who might have depression or anxiety or, you know, a mental illness that might, really impact you know they want to be informed but you start reading about people dying and you just go down a very dark you know maybe ptsd is affecting yep. you like really go down a deep dark place so maybe let's talk about some coping skills there yeah and that's you're getting into a great question because um you know obviously in my my career i've uh, tried to help a lot of people who've had all kinds of different mental health issues and you know if somebody's really um significantly impacted by their depression or anxiety or trauma or whatever they're going through, then, you know, the very first thing is just to remind people to stay connected with their, with their resources and their treatment and their support, you know, and now more than ever. And, and, you know, a lot of times I've talked to a few people lately and they say, well, you know, I, I'm nobody, how can I go see somebody? And so now the world has gone to online therapy. So the therapists are still there they're just talking like you and I are now instead of face to face, you know, and some people had already been doing online therapy, but almost all of the, uh, you know, a lot of the therapists have gone to just online therapy. So they're still there. And in fact, in some ways it's more accessible because now you can just get, you know, on your uh, phone or your laptop or whatever, and you can, you can do therapy. So by all means, I think people need to stay connected with their treatment providers and, and then their support system. You know, we all now need our support more than ever too. So, um, you know, I, I think that's kind of the, the, the first thing. And then back to your question, you know, so then if I'm really impacted by something I see in the media and it's very disturbing to me or it may create some uh, trauma, trauma symptoms for me or something like that, then obviously, you know, if I'm somebody's therapist, I'm going to say, well, let's, let's really minimize that exposure right now because right. that's going to be potentially really negative or harmful. Right, right. So, and to that point, is online therapy just as helpful? I mean, I know that's a little bit off topic, but still. Um, I, I just actually wrote a post on my site about making the most out of online therapy, and I encourage people to go take a look at that. Um, but uh, the, an the short answer to that is uh, from what we know, from the data we know, is that online therapy can be just about as effective as regular in-person therapy. Um, there are obviously are a few differences uh, just with the uh, technology and so forth. And that's kind of part of making the most of it is making sure the technology is working and that you can see and hear clearly and that, you know, you have a good connection and you're in a private space and nobody's going to walk in when you're having your therapy session and some of those kinds of things. But, you know, essentially what the therapists are doing is basically going to be very similar to what they would be doing in person. It's just going to be in an online format. So by all means, yeah, online therapy can be a great option. Understood, understood. Okay, I mean, I, I always say any therapy is better than, than no therapy. I don't, you know. <laughs> well, unless it's really bad therapy, because that sure, might, actually, okay. you know, not, not be good for you. But as long as you've got a good, competent, effective therapist, then yes, absolutely. It's better than better than no therapy. Okay. That's, that's a very, I, cause I've had bad therapists and bad therapists are usually the first thing, the first thing that come up when I talk to somebody and I say, have you considered, you know, somebody comes to me and they say, I have this problem. And I'm like, that's definitely something I can't help you with. Have you considered talking to a therapist? And the number one thing that comes up after that is either cost 
Uh, yeah. and, and that is, you know, quickly followed by, oh, I had a really bad experience with a therapist and I'm not about to go back. And it's heartbreaking. Yeah. yeah. And I, and I probably, I don't know, a couple of times a week, you know, I, I'm, somebody's asking me, I need to find a therapist or my cousin needs to find a therapist, you know, and I'm always helping people kind of like in my local area. Of course, I know a lot of therapists, but you know, you do, you have to kind of shop around and you have to make sure that you find somebody that's a good fit for you that the cost is going to work for you, that, you know, right now they're going to offer the online format. You have to kind of talk to them and screen them and make sure that it feels right for you. Um, you know, so there's a lot to that finding the therapist that can take a little bit of work in the beginning, but it is well worth it. And I always say to people, you know, think about the last time, like you got a new car, think about how much time you put into that, you know, and you right. went and you shopped around and you took a test drive and you did all these things. Well, finding a good therapist is every bit, you know, as important and you need to spend that amount of time when you're trying to find a therapist too. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I do want to kind of hop into questions because people are asking yeah. them as we go and I think they're relevant. So is that, is that okay? Yeah, All right. What we want to talk about. Yeah. Uh, so the first question, uh, the first question that's, that's relevant is, uh, do you usually need a referral to find a therapist? Uh, and the answer is usually no. No, yeah. I mean, you, you may want to check with your insurance. There might be still a few types of plans that kind of require that uh, sort of more old fashioned, like referral from your primary care doctor. But most of the time, no, most of the time you can just call the therapist directly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. So the next question I, I, I thought that was good is, um, do you feel if in person over the phone cyber sessions work better or does it depend on the person? Um, I mean, again, it's it's going to be that fit between the therapist and the person is going to be important. Um, but and also the therapist training, that's kind of another point to make, because not every therapist may be equally well trained at every kind of problem. So let's okay. say, for example, you have depression. One of the first things you want to ask any therapist that you talk to or that you're considering is, hey, what's your experience in treating depression? You know, how much have you done that? You know, how effective has it been generally? You want to because some some people may have sort of the type of practice where, okay, maybe they only treat anxiety. They don't treat depression. And so you right. just want to ask that question. Um, but if you can, you know, kind of find the person that has the qualifications, has the training, and is a good fit for you, then, you know, the question of in-person versus online, it may be pretty, pretty equivalent. Yeah. I, I, and I also say, you know, a lot of people that are here in, in my chat are often people who are looking you know, who connect with others through online means. So that's that if that's a way that you're used to communicating with people, then it's definitely a great way to help, you know, ease yourself into this idea of, of therapy, especially, you know, people with social anxiety and, and face to face anxiety. Um, it could definitely it could definitely help. You're yeah. not going to see a proctologist for an ear issue. Make sure your therapist is trained and deals with your specific issue. <laughs> exactly right. Yeah, that's right. The therapists do specialize, you know, you'll have. Yeah. Some that may only see children, for example, or some that only treat anxiety disorders or, you know, so there, you know, there really are people who specialize and, and a lot of times you can figure that out by looking at their website. Right, right. Or the Psychology Today article or, or any other way. And you guys on my website, there is a find a therapist tab. So if you are looking for a therapist, there's a lot of resources on there, like four different kinds of ways to start looking for a therapist. So um, yeah, don't don't give up. Um, thank you so much for the question so far. Uh, Duo asked, Fellowship of the Table asked, you guys ask Grace questions, and Tally, thank you so much for that comment. Um, so Kisa Prime asked, how do you actually cope with the negativity of, of things as you see them on social media without letting them overwhelm you? Oh, that's really tough. You know, one thing I think is uh, first recognize when it's impacting you negatively, and the, the way you're going to do that is usually you're just going to feel bad or you're going to start feeling more down. But when you notice that it's impacting you more negatively, that's kind of your cue to like, okay, what am I going to do about this? And so then maybe it's like you turn it off, you go take a walk or you go pet your dog or you go talk to a friend or, you know, you engage in something that's more pleasurable, more distracting, something that's going to bring you some positivity. Um, so I think part of it is recognizing the negativity and then being intentional about taking some steps to, you know, kind of cope with it. Okay. All right. That's great. Thank you. Uh, can you ask him, Laxus asks, can you ask him if it would be more beneficial for a war vet to look for uh, insurance 
and get a wizard who's not in the VA, is wizard <laughs> therapist, uh, yeah, uh, versus having only VA healthcare and using someone who you might be nervous to talk to because of that. Uh, I, you know, I'll just give an opinion. I don't, I don't know that I'm the authority on this. I mean, I, I worked uh, in a VA when, uh, when I was an intern. I did some training in a VA hospital. I haven't worked in the VA as a career or worked with veterans, you know, primarily. But I do know the, uh, the VA has some excellent therapists, psychologists, psychiatrists. Uh, it's certainly worth a, you know, worth a try because if that's what your insurance covers, then that's certainly, I would, I would try that route. Um, and many times people find that that's going to help them. If, if you've kind of exhausted that and it doesn't seem to be working and you have the financial resources to try another outside private therapist or something, then by all means, you know, you could try that. But I, I always try to encourage people to use their insurance if they can, because it's going to save you a ton of money if you stay in your insurance network. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I mean, it, and insurance in the U S is wild. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, Everybody, if you have any questions, please throw them in exclamation and the letter Q. Uh, I am going to go back to the topic of like adversity and, and handling adversity and everything. And so um, as we're seeing this, this uh, scary stuff come in, uh, you know, like uh, like people dying because of their race or, uh, you know, there's uh, recently been a lot of people exposed, unfortunately, in the content creation industry for being sexual predators and uh, a lot of people talk about, um, you know, that that stuff that's again, that's that's really hard to read, but you want to stay informed, but it's really hard to read. And um, so yeah. seeing like seeing directly graphic, you know, maybe you're encountering something graphic that might be triggering. Are we just uh, do you recommend just going back to the thing that you already said, which is, you know, distracting yourself, finding finding alternatives because I mean it's just like it's it's out there right like you see it yeah. sometimes before you're able to um, filter it out in some way yeah which is why you know I appreciate it and we're actually pretty good about this in the, in the mental health community a lot of times we'll post things with trigger warnings up front right, right. you know and it'll say hey this has content about suicide or something that's troubling or you know it'll give you kind of that warning up front unfortunately a lot of the media really doesn't do that and so you're on it before you know you know I mean, I, I even run into that, you know, on social media where somebody for some reason wants to post some horrendous picture of their injury to their leg or something. Sure, I'm like, sure. oh my God, why, I don't, why do I want to see that? But um, yeah, so sometimes you're on it, but you can get off of it. That is the other thing. It's right. just to remind yourself, you know, you don't have to stay on it. So, you know, you can, you can quickly move off of it if you know that that's going to be particularly sensitive or particularly graphic for you or particularly disturbing. Um, and, you know, then again, over time, you kind of start figuring out, well, yeah, this one site does this all the time. So maybe I need to stay away from this site because they do this kind of as a sensationalistic thing as, you know, kind of a clickbait thing almost. But uh, uh, yeah, so I think, you know, you can, you can, uh, again, filter out a little bit. But, but if you find that you've already been exposed to it, then again, I would go back to some of the coping mechanisms and go back to some of the things to kind of get you to a better place, you know, after that. Yeah. Yeah. So, but in general, there's, there's a lot of change going on. You're trying to, you know, a lot of people, so for example, again, back to the Black Lives Matter movement, there's a lot of uh, animosity on both sides of the issue where um, it seems like there shouldn't be a second side of the issue, right? Black Lives Matter, period. That's the end of the story. Uh, but um, you end up in arguments with people who you deeply love and, you know, your, your mm -hmm. parents, your relatives, who you have a lot of care for and you usually respect them and then they come out and they say something awfully just stupid or ignorant and, and it's hard to combat that. Do you have any advice for somebody who's going through something like that right now? Uh, yeah, I've had that happen, you know, more, more times than I would have ever imagined. Right, and, right. And, you know, so many times I'm just so taken aback. I'm shocked because, you know, you don't always expect it. You know, I can't believe that, you know, my dear friend would say something like that that's clearly so you know, shows such either ignorance or bigotry or racism or whatever, but, but then it, you know, then it's there. And so, um, um, oh man, you know, this is so, it hits me on a personal level just because I, you know, my whole career, I've always worked for anybody who has been disenfranchised or underserved or, you know, most of the people I saw when I worked at, at the hospital, you know, had uh, very, very few, if any resources and, you know, were really right. struggling. So, 
it, it, this hits me on many different levels, but um, I think when it does happen and you're, you're right there in the moment, you have to remind yourself of kind of the, uh, you know, choose your battles kind of thing. You know, do you always want to engage and do you always want to like, you know, really get into a super heated argument when you really maybe have no chance of changing their mind or, you know, that's right. just so entrenched, you know, or do you think, wow, it's just, they don't know, they don't know some information. And if I educate them, then they're going to have right. greater awareness and then they're going to see my point of view and then, then they will be more sensitive. And so sometimes it can work out well, but I think, you know, again, it's that sort of how much energy do I have to put into this? And, um, you know, you may have already be kind of depleted because you've been out protesting or you've been, you know, posting on social media or you've already been, you know, writing op-eds or you've been doing a lot of things. And so then we get emotionally exhausted. And it's probably not the best time to get into one of these knockdown drag out kind of things when you're already emotionally exhausted because, you know, you're just not going to be able to handle it as well. So I think you also have to think about kind of your own emotional, um, you know, it's like filling up the tank again. If your tank is already empty, it's not the best time to do it. When do you feel, because the one that I run into a lot is um, as as a white person, although I'm an immigrant and I'm a woman, I still feel like I've things have been fairly privileged for me. So yeah. how do I, I constantly deal, grapple with this, I'm not doing enough, I'm not doing enough. And you know, people will talk to me about the fact that like, I want to help and I wanna donate, but I don't have the money. And I want to help and go out protest, but I have agoraphobia. And so like, how, how do you kind of, I guess it's kind of a self answering question, but like, how do you give yourself a break and, and, and tell yourself that you, you know, you're doing what you can? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. And the first thought I have is that we all have to kind of remind ourselves to be kind to ourselves right now. I don't think any of us, myself included, would say that we're at our best right now. <laughs> you know, we're, we're all struggling on some different, different levels and, and some of us are facing way more struggles than others, obviously. Um, so you do have to kind of give yourself a break in terms of like, you know, I just can't, I can't do it all or I can't do as much as I want to do. However, on the other side, and I've actually written a lot about this on my website about advocacy, is there are a lot of simple and easy ways to get involved in all kinds of advocacy, whether that's mental health advocacy or anti-racism work or, you know, working for people who are, you know, discriminated in any, any number of different ways. Um, there's a lot of easy ways to get involved. And, you know, I, I even kind of framed it in terms of, you know, my goal for a while was like, if I could do five minutes a day, maybe that's the best I can do. And so in five minutes, maybe I could post a few things or maybe I can uh, comment on somebody's stuff or maybe I can share something that's really good. You know, I'm thinking about just simple social media kinds of things. And, you know, if I can do five minutes a day and that's all I can do, at least I feel like then I've done something. And then some days the five minutes turns into 15 or 20 or half an hour or an hour. And then it's like, whoa, you know, score. I, I actually, you know, I did great today. But um, sometimes I think, you know, setting those kind of really small goals is a way to get yourself at least a little bit motivated because it's then it's like, well, hey, yeah, I, you know, I did a little something. Yeah, yeah, I, I like that. But it's, it's, man, it's so hard. I'm one of those people that like a little bit is not enough to give myself credit for. And then before I know it, I'm like completely laid out and exhausted and like crying. And then I don't know how I got there, even though I know how I got there, which is, you know, overexposing and not giving myself time to recoup and everything. And yeah, emotional exhaustion is a really interesting concept right now. A lot of us, I think, are experiencing compassion fatigue and, I, um, and dealing with that, you know, first from just like the COVID outflow of all the news from covid and then you know the blm movement started and then for those of us in the, again in the content creation industry all of the accounts of the sexual predators came out and so it's just been a, a flood of constant like pay attention to this this is important pay attention to this this is important you have to be doing this you have to be talking about this you have to be and it, it, it it's yeah. hard and i i like i will feel guilty posting anything that's not related to those three topics but i know like mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah i feel like i i have to live also outside of that but it's really hard to give yourself credit to do that yeah because i think what happens is uh you know when you feel like maybe you're not doing enough then you feel like you're somehow letting other people down or you're not doing your part um but right 
you know, again, I, you know, I think if, if you do a little bit and you're consistent about that, and then over time that kind of builds up, builds up. I mean, you know, you think about the first time I ever tweeted on Twitter, I was like, well, I don't know where this will go. And, you know, now I'm like, you know, 16,000 tweets later, it's like, wow, where'd that come from? But, you know, it, it just happens over time. Um, and sometimes, you know, you don't see it as you're going through it, but incrementally, at least, you know, in, in the long range, you may have some, some greater uh, impact, but, you know, the other, the other part of it is just remind ourselves we not to always be so tough on ourselves because we're often our worst, you know, critic and, mm -hmm. and we have to uh, give ourselves some self-compassion too. Yeah. Self-compassion, man, what a, what a concept, what a concept, giving others compassion <laughs> and also giving ourselves compassion. I love it. I love it. Um, yeah. So I do I, let, wanna... me ask, let me tell you, let me tell you something really quick because the self-compassion thing, I have a psychologist friend who uh, actually ran a website and a podcast for a while and, and she's not doing it now, but she called it go friend yourself. And it was all about self-compassion. Oh, I love that. That's so cute. Yeah. Go, go friend yourself. And I think actually that podcast is still out there, which was really great. And you can still go listen to it. But, you know, I thought that was what a cool thing to think, you know, go friend yourself. You know, that's kind of a neat way. Yeah. I no, I remember the moment where my therapist had said that to me. And it blew my mind, which was, would you say any of this to a friend? Like what you're, you know, how you're treating yourself, how you're talking to yourself. Would you say any yeah. of this to a friend? And of course the answer is no, I would never. Right. Never that, let... That's a great test. That's a yeah. great test. If you put it to yourself that way, you know, you're going to, you're going to say, oh yeah, I'm putting my, I'm holding myself to a higher standard than I would you know, be holding my friends or my loved ones. But I think I interrupted you. Where were you going a minute ago? Uh, that's a great question, and I I couldn't tell you now. <laughs> You're fine. Sorry. You're fine. Sorry. No, no, please don't be sorry, because I interrupted you. I'm sure at some point it's all part of the conversation and it's flowing and it's it's good. It's good. Uh, but okay, all right. So I'm gonna hop into questions now because a lot of them are focusing on therapy. So I'd rather kind of answer the questions that people have already. But don't forget, everybody! Exclamation okay. the letter Q uh, to ask a question if you have for Dr. Sussman, preferably on topic. But if it's a little bit off topic and still in his purview, that's also okay. But just keep in mind, I'm gonna answer. You know, ask the on topic ones first. Uh, also, I moderate these, so you know, if you ask something stupid, I'm not going to ask it out loud. Just throwing that out there as well. Uh, yeah, ADHD does make things interesting. Yeah, that's that's exact, that's me in a nutshell. <laughs> I always say it's not an excuse, it's an explanation, but sometimes it's a funny explanation. <laughs> uh, so Kisa Prime asks, what are some options for people who live out in the boonies and don't have appropriate therapists that are close? Uh, you know, again, this may be where online therapy comes to the rescue because right. in some ways now it doesn't matter where the therapist is as long as you if you're out in the boonies as long as you've got a good internet connection you know and you can connect with a therapist the one thing i do encourage people to check though is when they're looking for online therapy you do want to uh, inquire where your therapist is licensed because sometimes mm -hmm. you get into tricky issues if you're living in one state and they're living in another state as far as like maybe they're not supposed to practice across state lines but you know sometimes that can be worked out depending on their license credentials or whatever but yeah, I would say online therapy may be worth a shot because, you know, there you, you don't have to go anywhere and you can see somebody who may be, you know, a few hours away from you. Right, right, right. Uh, okay, Z the Shadow asks, what advice do you have for someone who was taken away from therapy by family members insisting they don't need it? Ooh, that hits close to home. Ooh. Wow. Do, do we know if this is uh, somebody over the age of 18, like an adult? Or if it's yeah, just, uh, someone the, I... I can't ask that question, uh, but I'm. Yeah, I'm, I don't know. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna assume they're over 18 because if it's a kid, it's a little different, you know. But yeah, if you're over 18, and you, I guess I would want to know a little bit more. Does that mean that the family was paying for it, and now they're not paying for it anymore, or they're some they somehow prohibited it in some way? I mean, I, I think if you were an adult and you had your own resources, then maybe you have a way to, you know, go around and you know, secure another therapist. I don't, I don't know. I guess we would need to know a little bit more about the situation um, because yeah, I know some of those families are not supportive and that can be a huge problem. Um, and, and sometimes, you know, we even encourage people, we'll take your family into therapy with you and let them kind of learn more about what therapy is all about. And even if it's just for one visit, you know, to, to kind of talk with a the therapist and sometimes then the family can become more of an ally for the person in therapy. Yeah. 
Uh, I will say from my personal experience, if I could add, um, just looking for ways to, uh, like I didn't stop, I persevered and I tried to find ways to get therapy without my family being as aware of it. Um, and for me, the resources were out there. So for example, when I was in high school, my family was very against me going to therapy, but I was able to see the school psychologist. I was able to, if you go to your uh, guidance counselor, they should be able to point you to the school psychologist and um, you, if, if your school yep. has a psychologist um, and they might be able to take you out of like gym class or something like that. So if, if you're um, under 18, if you're over 18, like same similar thing where I went and I found out that in my college uh, there was a uh, college therapist that did sessions yeah. for free. So my parents had no idea about it at all. Um, also, similarly, if you're not in college, you can go to your um, uh, like your main, your regular practice doctor and they might be able to direct you to another doctor and then you just... I've made up excuses. I've done the done the whole thing and said like, "Oh, I'm learning an instrument." That's I was learning an instrument for for five years for as far as everybody knew. But yeah, um, right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but it is that is that is a tough question. It's kind of it's it's heartbreaking. It's tough. It's tough. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I guess I would just add. I would, I would add to that. You know, just to hopefully tell the person to keep trying. You know. Yeah. You know, they, there may be some some angle or some way to persuade the family to be more on board with it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much, Katie. If anyone needs uh, finding resources on their college campus, I'm always willing to help working in higher ed. I can help find things easy on any campus. Thank you. So thank you so much for offering yourself as a resource. That's, that's awesome. It is, it is a really sad situation because it's somebody who's saying, all right, I'm ready to get help. And then there's more barriers than there are already. Like there's already a lot of barriers in the U S to getting mental health care. So having more of them in your family is, is, is difficult. I get it. Um, but yeah, it is, it's tough. Uh, okay. Radical asks, Radical, who's also, by the way, a therapist, uh, she, I absolutely adore her. Uh, how do you see the pandemic leaving long lasting changes to the way therapy and related services are accessible for clients and provided by therapists? Uh, yeah, I, I don't know, but I, I kind of think uh, online therapy is going to be more, more common. Uh, as a result of all this, which may really open up access in a lot of like rural areas or underserved areas. So, uh, uh, because I think people are seeing some of the benefits and just how, how it can be more convenient. And, you know, you, you think about there's less cost for the therapist because, you know, they're not having to like keep and all that kind of stuff maybe. Um, so I, I, I would be uh, hopeful that it may be able to improve access in some ways. Yeah. Yeah, same. Uh, if anybody has questions about finding a therapist or even know insurance, uh, how insurance works, they can always hit me up. Hey, Dr. K is also offering herself up as a resource. That's amazing. Uh, so thank you. Thank you so much for that. So somebody's asking in chat, and I just want to address it because I, I don't think we can address it. Uh, anyone in chat know about resting heart rate and how the brain works uh, with feeling that a specific person... To Hmm. Okay. Uh, special snowflake, if you can clarify exactly, cause I saw your question before about resting heart rate and trying to get your resting heart rate down. I'm assuming you're feeling anxious, but I don't want to assume. So if you can formulate the question in a, you know, in a concise manner, we might be able to try to answer it somehow, maybe, I don't know. Uh, but <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Zesman, thank you again so much for being on. I'm going to take this moment to continue picking your brain, if that's okay with you, since we ran out of uh, yeah, audience yeah. questions. What's, what's left of it? Go right ahead. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, so my next question is, there, I mean, there's a lot of, so the experience of, of guilt uh, is going on. Uh, the other, the other thing is like, there's, um, there's, uh, yeah, I think that just not doing enough, that's been the biggest, the biggest, biggest piece for me even though I know I'm doing I can at the time but the whole feeling of like not doing enough I keep I keep coming I keep coming back to that um and especially when it comes to like things I can't understand right like the black black lives matter movement I will never be able to experience and to to experience firsthand what somebody's going through to be so I'll, and I'm a very empathetic person. I consider myself an empath. And so I can feel like somebody's, I can feel pain 
not for them, but I can, I, you know, I can feel their pain and I can empathize, but I can never put myself in their shoes. And I kind of like feel guilty about that. Is that, is that a thing? I don't know. Is that a thing? I think, I think it's really natural. I mean, you know, my first thought when you, you know, come back to the, like, you're not doing enough is let me, let me put one thing in perspective for you. I could count on the fingers of one hand, the people I know who are doing any kind of regular live streaming mental health shows right now. There are about this many, I think, in America, and you're one of them. And so, you know, that's incredible. You know, you let's give props right here to anxiety. I mean, that is incredible. And that you have had this kind of dedication and this kind of perseverance. And you're, you, I mean, I, I, I admire you. I mean, I think you're, you're actually a role model. And, you, you, you know, you're going to have a great influence on kind of this, this uh, upcoming generation. So I, want, I just wanted to say that because I think it needs to be said. Um, the second part of it, which you talked about is, yeah, it's hard for us to sometimes know other people's perspective because we haven't lived through it, but it doesn't mean that we can't educate ourselves and it doesn't mean that we can't speak up for them. And it doesn't mean that we can't reach out and support them. And it doesn't mean we can't show up when they need us. And so there's a lot we can still do, you know, to show that we're there and that we've got their back, even though we've maybe never walked that mile in their shoes before. So that's, you know, I think maybe that's helpful. I don't know. No, that's very helpful. Thank you very much. That's a lot. I promise I wasn't fishing for a compliment. So to, to get one thrown in there, that was that was very nice. Thank you. Well, uh, well, it's well deserved. Seriously. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you kindly. And we're, we're, we're I'm just trying to do my best. Um, so but yes, for special snowflake, I recommend definitely just I would talk to a doctor. I don't think that we can. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think that we can really help you here. But Sasbro is asking an interesting question. And I think it can be pretty generalized, which useful tactics to stop yourself from dwelling over or obsessively thinking about something that you have little, uh, con you know, um, you, you, you have little control over that keep distracting you. Mm -hmm. So this is something that that's going, you know, I will lay there awake thinking about all the sexual predators in the industry and thinking about what the hell can I do? Okay, so I have this talk show and I'm going to, uh, you know, I'm going to have a professional on and I'm going to grill him with all these questions. And what do I have to ask? Like, I, you know, I will lay there awake at night thinking about this stuff and it's, it's consistent yeah. and they're repetitive thoughts. And yeah, so I, I do, uh, I would like to join Sasbro in asking that question. Like, what do you recommend from, from dwelling on this stuff? Yeah. And, yeah, and that, you know, that can be um, kind of something we all go through normal worry and concern and, you know, you kind of ruminate about things or you have you have trouble getting something off your mind. To some extent, that's kind of normal stuff. But, you know, it can reach the level where it can, you know, require treatment. I mean, there's a type of anxiety called generalized anxiety disorder, which is characterized by kind of this constant worrying, 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 rumination, okay. which, you know, yeah, which, which responds really well to uh, therapy. Usually cognitive behavioral therapy is perfect for that. And um, sometimes people may also have a, you know, some medication that goes along with it. But, you know, those kind of things are really treatable. Um, if I think if somebody's in doubt and they just feel like, man, this is getting worse, then, you know, go ahead and consult with a therapist or talk to somebody, get an opinion, see if maybe some uh, kind of short-term therapy might, might help you. But if it's not to that level, if it's kind of just your you know, you're worrying, you know, it's on your mind, then that's where we can, we can try some of those things like, the distracting or, you know, talking to someone or, you know, doing some healthy exercise or activity or, you know, going outside in nature or, you know, just all those kinds of things that we can do that are sort of those healthy uh, coping skills that, you know, we can use to interrupt kind of that, that thought process. Um, another thing that we sometimes do in therapy, which sounds kind of weird, is you might even prescribe for somebody like, okay, well, just sit for 20 minutes a day and worry about this. Just put, turn on the clock sit there for 20 minutes, worry all you want, and then get up, you know, and then just go on and do something else. And so you sort of prescribe, you call it worry time. And so one of two things will happen. They'll either come back and they'll say, well, yeah, it worked pretty well. I worried for 20 minutes and then I got up and I went and did something else. Or they'll sometimes say, you know, that was the most ridiculous thing. I couldn't sit there for 20 minutes. I, you know, got up after 10 minutes and I went and did something else. But either way, you can see the outcome is great because, you know, either way you're going to limit kind of that, that worrying time so you know that that's kind of another thing that sometimes people might try and see if it helps yeah i like that that that's that's actually what helped me that's and i've noticed that when i don't do that 
Uh, so my doctor called it, I think, un, like part of the unwinding process, basically when I'm going to bed to give yeah. myself this is this is nervous time. Yeah. And then if I'm in bed and I start doing that to get up physically out of bed, go somewhere else to do the worrying and then to, to kind of teach your brain that like bed is for sleeping, not for worrying. If you're in bed worrying, you're you're doing it in the wrong place kind of thing. It's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And actually, you know, a lot of people have sleep problems, too. And that, you know, those are called sleep hygiene kind of tips. And one of them is, you know, you save the bed just for sleeping. You know, you don't, you don't do social media in the bed. You don't watch TV in bed, whatever. You just, when you get in the bed, it's for sleeping. Yeah. Yeah. Bed is only for two things. Yeah. Hey, Dr. K. I've, I've written an article on that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think I called it, uh, bed is for sleeping. And then, okay, I guess one other thing. That's what I said. Uh, yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> For, betrayed by personal attacks. Yeah, Super Gaijin, that's where you go. You come into stream, sometimes things, sometimes things get personal. Uh, but, okay, all right. Do you guys have any other questions? Ask them now, because Dr. Sussman is only here for like 10 more minutes, so I want to make sure that we have, you know, we get them. You set a time for worry, yeah. Uh, you think when uh, it's intrusive thoughts, it helps you sink into a bad mental space, so allocating time helps reduce that happening. So thank you very much. Stride Cypher asks, what are some good questions to ask a first time therapist in order to find out if they are a match for you? I know that you mentioned things like state licensure and network costs. What about things like religious issues, treatment issues, resources and th uh, that the therapist endorses? Yeah, I mean, usually, you know, most therapists are gonna do kind of a free 30 minute consultation or something, you know, they'll talk to you online or on the phone or whatever. and. Um, uh, you know, before you call them, I would do a little bit of the homework ahead of time. You go on their website or you go on the therapist directory or whatever, and you kind of, you know, get some idea about their background, their training, their education, their licensure, the kinds of things that they treat. Um, ideally, if you have a friend or family member who's been to them and says, oh, they're wonderful, well, that's a great thing, you know, right. if you can get that kind of personal recommendation. But I think when you talk to them, I always want to say, you know, hey, I think here's what I'm kind of dealing with. And are you experienced, you know, we kind of said that before, but are you experienced in, in dealing with these kinds of issues and really make sure that they have that kind of experience? And then, you know, you might then say, you know, and generally, how does treatment kind of work for that and see what they say and, uh, you know, see if what they describe kind of matches up with what you have in mind or, you know, if that sounds like a reasonable kind of plan for you. Um, and, and, and then I guess some of it's just that, uh, sort of personality thing. Do they seem like a genuine person, compassionate? Are they listening to you? Do they seem like, you know, you would be able to sit and talk with them, you know, like this online? Can you do that for an hour a week? Is that going to be okay? Do you feel like that would, you know, you could handle that and just with their personality? So some of it's kind of that fit thing as well. Got it. Got it. So, hey, Dr. K, who is a therapist herself, asks, uh, Lacken or Freud? Ah, well, maybe sadly uh, for, for her, I, you know, I had some basic uh, psychoanalytic training, but uh, I'm much more of kind of a cognitive behavioral therapist. So probably, uh, probably a little more Freud, but um, uh, I'm actually probably more from the uh, Aaron Beck school. <laughs> Got it. Okay. She says CBT, CBT, CBT. So I think you're, yeah, all, yeah, you're right. all in agreement. And then, and then a, a little bit, I'll throw in a little bit of DBT, Marshall Linehan. <laughs> we i love dbt was fantastic to learn about it really really did change a lot of things even though i have depression anxiety which is not normally what it's used for but it, it was just a different thought process that was that was really great i dbt was good too but cbt was saved my life yep. yeah uh z the shadow asks what can i do to boost myself if i'm experiencing a major depressive episode Wow. So if you really are having a major depressive episode, then you definitely, I would say, should be getting some treatment. And, you know, typically we think of that as probably a combination of uh, therapy and, and probably some medication, you know, at least at least for a while to kind of help help bring you out of that kind of real deep part of the depression. Um, I, yeah, I think you, you probably need some guidance from uh, from a professional. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's usually where I go as well. Yeah, I get those a lot. You guys are absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much for all the questions that you uh, that you asked. Do you have Dr. Sussman? great great people out there. 
They are, aren't they? They're absolutely, they're, they're, they're lovely. Not only are they like open to picking somebody's brain, but they like sit there and listen. And I don't know if you've been reading the comments as, they, as they've been rolling in, but there's quite a few compliments for you as well. Uh, um, uh, Gaijin, Super Gaijin said that he seems like you, you seem like somebody who would have an easy time talking to. So I think that's a wonderful compliment. Thank you. I've thank been you accused so much. Of Oh, oh, it's it's an okay accusation, right? Not so bad. Um, do you have any closing comments for us? Anything that you want to make sure that people know before you before you leave? I guess it's putting you on the on the spot. So if you don't have any, that's okay too. Well, I mean, I, I always just like to state the obvious, and one is just to remind people that you don't have to struggle. You can ask for help, and it's okay to ask for help. It is always okay to ask for help. Um, and then, you know, then the tricky part may be finding that right therapist or finding the, you know, the right kind of support that you need. But I just, I hate to see people struggle and many people do, they struggle for months or years in silence. And, you know, that really most of the time does not need to happen. There's help and it's, and it's available and treatment is effective. And we got lots of resources and a great mental health community. And, um, so I just, I really encourage people to, even if it's the hardest thing you can imagine, try to take that step and call for help when you need it. Yeah, yeah. Do you have, uh, last question, do you have any questions for us also, I guess? The answer could be no. Oh, wow, geez. Hmm. I guess, the, you know, maybe if I'm allowed to just ask you a question, it's just like, what's the most fun, fun part for you about doing all this? But if, uh, absolutely. Um, I, I think it's the people that I get to connect to very loud. Uh, I think it's it's the people that I get to connect to daily and the fact that I get to talk to people from across, like there are several people right now watching me that are in Australia, hours and hours wow. and hours away from me. And we get to communicate and talk and I would have never ever had a reason to meet them if it wasn't for this stream and creating this community space. And that is mind blowing. And in that same vein, seeing that those people like we're all so similar. You're from Australia, from New Zealand, from you know Germany, from the UK. We have all kinds of people here, and all of us so often agree on stuff, agree on you know how we feel and and thoughts, and that like that blows my mind that we're so we're different. Of course, we're very different, but also being so similar is really cool. Yeah. Yeah, I've had I've had a kind of similar experience. I mean, I've. I've uh, profiled people from Australia and from Europe and, you know, of course, all around America. And I've made some, you know, great friends that are in this sort of mental health advocacy community. And people have always been really uh, very welcoming to me. Yeah, it's amazing. It's a wonderful feeling. Well, thank you. Thank you so, so much again, Dr. Sussman, for being on with us. Uh, that is uh, that is David Sussman's website. So please go check it out. All of his blog posts are there. It links out to all of his social media. So that's the easiest place to find uh, you know, everything. Cool. I'm a lady. TD Bell, shame. Shame on you for using that command, but thank you. Uh, but yes, so uh, please do check out all of um, all of his resources. They're fantastic. There's also a blog post from me on there if you wanna, if you're wondering where to start, uh, so you can go and check that out. But thank you, thank you so much again for being here. I appreciate you. Everybody, we are going to take a quick break and then we're gonna come back with our uh, giveaway for a depression self-care kit. So I will see you soon again. Thank you so much, Dr. Sussman. Appreciate you. I hope to have you back someday. Thanks for having me and keep up the great work that you're doing. And uh, I really have appreciated uh, talking with your audience. It's been great. Thank you. Thank you so much. See you soon, everybody. Bye. Bye.